Well, it's safe to say that no Hebrew man or Hebrew woman living in first century AD would have heard the term high priest and wondered what it was referencing. Any Hebrew man or any Hebrew woman would have heard that term high priest. Most of them probably would have had this sort of picture in their heads. A picture of a man who had a bloodline that traced its way back through Aaron all the way onto Levi. A man who was clothed with an ephod and crowned with a turban. A man who once a year would go into the Holy of Holies to offer sacrificial blood for the covering of sin. The majority of Hebrew men, the majority of Hebrew women, when they heard the term high priest, that is what they would have pictured. Jesus met not one of those criteria. Not one. From the tribe of Judah, not Levi. Clothed in simple garments befitting the labor of a carpenter. Visiting the temple, sure, but not going into that holy of holies. Yet the author to the Hebrews transitioning from his focus on Jesus' superiority to Moses and Jesus' superiority to the angels, is now making the claim that Jesus, the Son of God, is in fact the great high priest. Better than the high priest from the line of Aaron. It's a claim he's going to expound upon in great detail from here all the way up to the midpoint of chapter 10. So it's about five chapters worth of turning the diamond on Jesus' superiority as great high priest and the superiority of the offering he as great high priest makes. In today's text, we have in microcosm, many of the facets of Jesus' high priestly ministry that will be explained in length in these latter sections. So we're going to content ourselves today with majoring on a few of them, minoring on others, knowing that what is minor today will become majors in, in the weeks to come. We're going to major on three things total, three characteristics of Jesus as great high priest. Jesus is son. Jesus is sinless. And Jesus is sympathetic. Those are the three things we're going to major on this morning. Jesus is son. Jesus is sinless. Jesus is sympathetic. And we are going to begin with Jesus as son. The first thing I want you to note, and hopefully you have a Bible in front of you and you can look through these texts, the first thing I want you to note is that Hebrews is laboring to draw a connection between Jesus as the great high priest and Jesus as son. The text begins, chapter 4, verse 14. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. Chapter 5, verse 6, you are a priest forever. Before that, chapter 5, verse 5, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Chapter 5, verse 10, being designated by God a high priest. A little bit earlier, verse 8, although he was a son. Three times over, Hebrews labors to show us that the office of great high priest and the office of son of God are in fact held by the same man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. Hebrews wants us to see Jesus' sonship and Jesus' high priesthood working together, functioning together, joined at the hip, so to speak. And we, of course, want to ask, why? Why these two? Why priest and why son? I mean, Jesus is also the good shepherd. So why didn't he go on about Jesus as being priest and shepherd? Or Jesus is also the great prophet. So why not go on here about how Jesus is the great priest and the great 
prophet? Is it as if he has before him just kind of a mix and match combo of all of Jesus' titles and he simply picks the number five, which is son of God and great high priest? Is it arbitrary or is there something uniquely significant about tying in the son of God with the high priest? Well, one way to get to an answer of that question is just ask, have we seen this anywhere else in Scripture? And the answer is, yes, we have. Prior to the pairing of priest and son in Hebrews, we see the same pairing in the book of Exodus. God says of his people, the Israelites, so the the Israelites as a whole, he says to this people, when they're about to flee Egypt, Exodus 4, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. Then over in Exodus 19, he says of the exact same people, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. It's not insignificant that we just got done talking about this very people. The people that, though called God's son, lowercase s, and though they were called a kingdom of priests, they hardened their hearts in their rebellion against God. The priest son of the Exodus generation failed. So is that the priest's son that Hebrews has in mind here? Is he wanting us to connect Jesus to the failed priest's son of the Exodus generation? Well, look with me at that center pairing of priest's son in our text today. It occurs in chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. It's at the very center of what is a, a chiastic pattern. It's kind of the author's way of saying, hey, if you really want to know what's important to me today... Follow the matching topics as they work you all the way inward to what I have labeled dead center. And that's verse 5 and verse 6. And we have there Jesus as son, Jesus as priest. But note, he's not quoting from Exodus. You are my son is a quote not from Exodus, but Psalm 2. You are a priest forever is not a quote from Exodus, but Psalm 110. See, through, see, though the Exodus generation, like Adam in the garden before them, though they were a failed priest son, it's in the Psalms, beginning in Psalm 2 and stretching all the way through the narrative of the Psalms and hitting Psalm 110, that we see a priest's son who will come and will not fail. This priest's son is foretold in Psalm 2's, I will declare of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. And he arrives. And he is enthroned in Psalm 110's, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And verse four, the Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. See, Hebrews is looking back, tracing the plot line of the Psalms and saying Psalm 2 Culminated in Psalm 110 is a story written about Jesus. And by the way, he's not the only one. The Gospels seem to be picking up on this exact same story. Jesus, at the very beginning of his ministry, at his baptism, he's baptized, and what do we hear? It's Psalm 2. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Days before Jesus' death, on the back end of his ministry, Jesus' question, he offers a question back, and he does so using Psalm 110. Sit at my right hand until until I put your enemies under your feet. And then he adds, if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? 
See, Hebrews, pulling from the Psalms, and perhaps the Gospels as well, is saying this. The same Son, whom God appointed the heir of all things, and through whom he also created the world. The same Son, who is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. The same Son, who upholds the universe by the word of his power. The same Son, foretold in Psalm 2, enthroned in Psalm 110. The same Son has become the great high priest. Who, after making purification for sins, sat down of the majesty on high. You are my son. You are a priest forever. These are words from the, from the Father about Jesus. So Jesus, the great high priest, is the Son of God, and Jesus, the great high priest, is also sinless. So the high priest in Jerusalem They were chosen from among men. Chapter 5, verse 1. Chosen from mere men. Chosen from men who were flesh and blood and a heart deceitful above all things. Like the people they represented, they too were ignorant. They too were wayward. They too were of the flesh, sold under sin, perhaps possessing the desire to do what was right, but had not the ability to carry it out. Every single one of them were beset with weakness. Every single one of them was lacking the strength to, needed to live holy in a sinful world. For this reason, they were obligated, as chapter 5, verse 3, obligated to offer sacrifice for their own sins just as they did for the sins of the people. They, in a very real way, approached God with the blood of a spotless lamb clothed in garments stained with sin. Jesus is different. Jesus, the great high priest, is sinless, peerless in perfection before his God. That's glorious, right? Much better than the high priests beset with weakness. But how does it make you feel to know that your great high priest is sinless? How do you perceive him knowing that he, unlike you and unlike me, never once committed a single sin? Would you expect such a priest to be relationally warm to you? Near to you? Interested in you? Involved with your life, or knowing that you've sinned, knowing that he never did, would you maybe perceive him as just a bit distant? Just a bit disinterested? Might we even go as far to say that he's perhaps a bit bothered by you and your constant weakness? Ask it another way. Do you picture the Holy One beckoning you toward him with open arms? Or do you picture the Holy One turning his face away in hopes that you'll stay where you are? Does his sinlessness make you think, oh, well, if that's how he is, then he must be very, very different than me. See, when a sinful people hear about a sinless man, we don't by nature assume affection. Hebrews is not surprised by that. In fact, it almost seems to ask us, would it perhaps change your mind if I were to tell you that your sinless great high priest knows what it feels like 
to be tempted and to suffer. Chapter 4, verse 15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Any guess as to why the author uses a double negative here? He says, we do not have a great high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. I mean, double negatives are kind of clunky. It's the reason most of our middle school teachers probably told us to get rid of them in our papers, right? We get confused. We we get messed up. We think they're saying one thing. We think they're saying another. Why does Hebrews use a double negative here, knowing that it might trip us up a bit? Perhaps he uses a double negative because he knows what it is we're assuming. If Jesus is that great, surely he doesn't get us. If Jesus is that perfect, certainly he's going to be annoyed by our weakness. If Jesus is that spotless, obviously he's not going to sympathize with our weakness. Hebrews jumps in and says, no, 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 no. We do not have a great high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness. And for clarity, we can take the two double negatives, we can can let them cancel each other out. And it says this, church, I want you to hear this. It says this, we do have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. We do. We have a high priest who is able to sympathize. Jesus, can you sympathize with our weaknesses? Can you lean in when when we're feeling weary? Can you be there for us when we feel we can no longer carry on? Jesus says, yeah, I can do that. I'm hearing you, and I'm here to help. So that's the thing, isn't it? Jesus' sinlessness is not a distant and untested sinlessness. It's not a sinlessness that's never been challenged to obey in the face of an incoming train of difficulty and suffering. It's not a sinlessness via lack of contact with the sinful world, lack of leaning into life here, lack of breathing this air and walking this street and living what we call real life. He's not the CEO on the top floor who's never done a day's work down in the warehouse. Remember, Jesus took up residence here. He lived here. He was tested here. 30 years from Jerusalem to Egypt to Nazareth to Galilee to Perea, the Decapolis, and back again. From fields to deserts, mountains and seas, mangers to his home, to an upper room, to the temple, to a cross, before Pharisees, before priests before Sadducees, before scribes, before tax collectors and fishermen and centurions and the paralyzed and the sick and the leprous, before family, before friend, before foe. And get this, when family and when friend turned into foe, Jesus, the great high priest, entirely unlike the high priest in the line of Aaron, withstood these things, took on these things, felt the trials, felt the troubles, felt the torments, and the banner over him is yet without sin. Ever obedient to the Father from eternity past, he learned a new form of obedience here. Obedience in the ring of suffering. Ever perfect from before the dawning of time, he was made perfect here by living out a full and holy human life. And though he could have at any moment, any moment, called down a myriad of angels to pull him out of the suffering, yet... He instead offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears and reverence and trust. His father would hear him. So stand in awe of him. 
recognize the one who is the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him knows what it feels like to be human. And he, get this, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power, knows what it feels like to be weak. Have you ever felt weak? It's kind of like asking, you ever, you ever breathe air before? You ever drink water? I mean, we are beset with weakness. Maybe for you, you've known a weight of depression that can, that can hang so heavily upon you, be so authoritative over you, make you feel like you just have nothing, no desire, no ability to overcome it. Maybe you are all too familiar with temptation to sin, how it lures you in and wraps its tentacles around you and whispers, just give in. You know it's inevitable. You've been here before and you have no strength. Maybe it's anger or envy or pride or sloth that at just the moment you think you've rid yourself from it, there it is again. Have you ever felt weak, without strength? The shocking truth is that in the midst of your weakness, Jesus, the sinless great high priest, is not leaning away from you. He's not saying, I don't get it, what's your problem? He's leaning in and saying, I am here to help. What then shall we say in response to such things? How about this? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. See, see this is where it all comes together. The call to draw near to a throne. That's where we're getting pulled right now, the call to draw near to a throne, and it is not just any throne. It's the very throne of God Most High, the throne from which flashes lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, the throne that's lined by the seven torches of fire, the seven spirits of God, the very throne that has the sea of glass before it and the four creatures around it that ever cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God who was and is to come. Hebrews says, draw near to that throne. Go forward to that throne in your time of greatest need and deepest shame and most discouraging moments. Move onward and move unencumbered with great certainty and surest boldness to that throne because Jesus is there. He is there as the Son at the right hand of the Father. He is there as great high priest, ever living to intercede for you. Make no mistake, my brothers and sisters, the throne of God is a throne of grace. The Son of God belongs on a throne, and because he is the great high priest, the throne is a throne of grace. So say, say you've been walking away from the Lord for some time. You've been indulging in sinful pleasures of this world. You've been gone for too long. You've ignored him for too long. You've been running away for too long. No, you haven't. Draw near. His throne is a throne of grace. Say, say that sexual sin has gotten a hold of you. You keep trying to hide it. You keep trying to suppress it. But it's just gotten deeper and it's just gotten darker. Just gotten a stronger grip upon your heart. You've run up a debt of sin that's too great for him to pardon. No, you haven't. His throne, brothers and sisters, is a throne of grace. Say so you've gotten bitter at God. You've been doubtful about him. He's not provided you with the job you wanted or the spouse you wanted or the kids you wanted, the health you wanted. You feel as if he showed up for everyone around you but you. You feel as if you've reached the point 
and you just don't have the ability anymore, you don't have the desire anymore, you don't have the capacity anymore to keep pressing on in faith. No, you haven't, my friends. Draw near. His throne is a throne of grace. So in the midst of the strongest temptations, after succumbing to the greatest of sins, in all the moments when you think, I don't have energy for what I got to do today. I don't, I got to make this decision. I don't have the wisdom to do this today. I have all this stress, I have all this fear, all this temptation, all this pain, all this weakness, and I'm just now waking up to the fact that I'm a mere human being. Draw near. Draw near to the beloved son of the father who calls you brother. Draw near to the great high priest who washes you white as snow. Draw near, my brothers, and my sisters to the throne of grace. For those of you who have never done that, you've never drawn near to God in your life. Maybe you assumed he wouldn't want you there. Maybe you assumed he wouldn't welcome you in Maybe you thought you needed to clean yourself up a bit before showing up. Hear these words to you right now as he calls to you from his throne of grace. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I'll grant him to sit with me on my throne. Do you hear his voice? (laughs) Open the door. (laughs) Draw near to him as he draws near to you this morning. If you want to know more about how to do that, a few of us will be up here after the service. We'd love to talk to you. What does it look like for a sinner who's in need of a Savior to draw near? So, brothers and sisters, Jesus has passed through the heavens into the very presence of his Father. He is standing right now, ever ready for you to draw near to him in your greatest time of need. So, draw near. Now, each Sunday, we come here. We come to this table. And it's at this table we remember that Jesus came to live and to die and to rise again for you and for me. It's at this table we remember and we celebrate and we proclaim that he has become the eternal source of salvation for all who obey him. So if you're here today and you've trusted in Jesus, if you put your faith in Jesus, you've drawn near to him, we invite you to take and to eat as the elements are passed. If you have yet to put your trust in Jesus, we ask, let the elements pass, don't don't partake, but we pray you would, in this moment, draw near for the very first time by faith. I'll invite the pastors to come. We're going to distribute the bread first. It's all gluten-free bread. We're going to distribute the bread first. You'll take and hold it. His body is the true bread. Let us serve you.